Welcome to the experiment. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you're all ready, here is the exam. Questions 1 to 4. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words for each detail. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. Who did Tom meet last night? B. Where did they go? Tom, did you enjoy the film last night? I didn't actually go to the cinema. My sister suggested seeing the film together at the weekend. So did you just stay in then? I decided to go to the gym. But I was on the way there when my cousin called. Do you remember you met her last summer? Oh yes, she was nice. Well, she had a spare ticket for a concert, so I went along to that with her. It was brilliant. Tom, did you enjoy the film last night? I didn't actually go to the cinema. My sister suggested seeing the film together at the weekend. So did you just stay in then? I decided to go to the gym. But I was on the way there when my cousin called. Do you remember you met her last summer? Oh yes, she was nice. Well, she had a spare ticket for a concert, so I went along to that with her. It was brilliant. Question 2. A. Where does the conversation take place? B. What does the woman decide to have? Have you decided what you want to eat? Um, what's today's special? It's fish and chips. That sounds nice. What do you think? Well, I love fish and chips, but I had it last night. I think I'll have the chicken salad. Hmm. The lamb curry is tempting. Or the prawn salad, perhaps? No, I'll go for the same as you. I've had it here before and it's delicious. Have you decided what you want to eat? Um, what's today's special? It's fish and chips. That sounds nice. What do you think? Well, I love fish and chips, but I had it last night. I think I'll have the chicken salad. Hmm. The lamb curry is tempting. Or the prawn salad, perhaps? No, I'll go for the same as you. I've had it here before and it's delicious. Question 3. A. Which university department would like to have more women students? B. Who has advised the university on attracting more female students? We as a university are proud that we have many female students in departments that are largely male in other universities. Over one third of our engineering students are women, for example. But although roughly half of the students doing medicine and dentistry here are women, the numbers studying architecture are relatively low at only 5%, and we're keen to improve matters. We've made a start on that by talking to head teachers, and that's already given us some useful ideas. We're now going to ask school leavers to fill in a questionnaire, and we've also planned a series of interviews with our current female students.
We as a university are proud that we have many female students in departments that are largely male in other universities. Over one third of our engineering students are women, for example. But although roughly half of the students doing medicine and dentistry here are women, the numbers studying architecture are relatively low at only 5%, and we're keen to improve matters. We've made a start on that by talking to head teachers, and that's already given us some useful ideas. We're now going to ask school leavers to fill in a questionnaire, and we've also planned a series of interviews with our current female students. Question 4. A. What is the hotel next to? B. Which new activity will be available for hotel guests next year? In this program, we are going to tell listeners about a number of places which offer opportunities for weekend breaks. The first one is the Rainbow Hotel. This is in a lovely part of Switzerland. Although it's some distance from the mountains, it has a beautiful location overlooking a lake and is the ideal place for anyone who's eager for a weekend's escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. It offers guests a number of activities, from cycling and quad biking to sailing and swimming. This year, pony trekking has proved to be a popular addition to what's on offer and windsurfing is going to be introduced next June. In this program, we are going to tell listeners about a number of places which offer opportunities for weekend breaks. The first one is the Rainbow Hotel. This is in a lovely part of Switzerland. Although it's some distance from the mountains, it has a beautiful location overlooking a lake and is the ideal place for anyone who's eager for a weekend's escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. It offers guests a number of activities, from cycling and quad biking to sailing and swimming. This year, pony trekking has proved to be a popular addition to what's on offer, and windsurfing is going to be introduced next June. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment, you will hear question five. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 5. You will hear a talk about an Italian wood sculptor called Aldo De Luca. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. I'm here today to tell you a little about an extraordinary Italian sculptor called Aldo De Luca. I discovered him quite by chance. I'd gone to Italy to spend some time in Florence, visiting the fascinating art galleries there. While I was there, I decided to go and see Padua before heading back to my everyday life. And while I was there, I happened to come across Da Luca's showroom right in the centre of the city. I'd just been to a museum and was very excited by some of the wonderful modern paintings I'd seen there. Suddenly, I noticed a clothesline hanging across the window of a sculptor's showroom. That's odd, I thought. Why on earth would a sculptor have his T-shirts and socks hanging up to dry in his showroom window? I was curious, and I decided to enter the showroom. Once inside, I saw Aldo de Luca himself working on a carving. He was making a jacket. It was simply beautiful and very realistic. It was only then that I realised that 
everything in the window of the showroom was actually made of wood. And a coat on a hook on the wall was made of wood too, as was a hat above it. I had to touch it because it was so hard to believe that all the items I saw around me were actually not real. I got talking to Aldo da Luca, and he told me that the wood he was using to carve the jacket was walnut. He told me he often uses cherry, which he said was his favourite, and many of his most successful works are made of a type of Italian pine. Da Luca takes much of his inspiration from the ordinary objects we wear or use every day. However, he's also interested in designing pieces that represent abstract ideas. He showed me one of his pieces which he'd called Happiness. I was really struck by the beauty of this piece. He said he likes working on both types of work equally, as they provide different challenges for him as an artist. I asked him which of the many works of art he's created is his favourite. First, he showed me a work called Raincoat. I really loved it. But then he changed his mind and chose a different work called Umbrella. He could only show me a photo of that, but it was certainly an impressive piece. My own personal favourite was a wonderful chair with a seat made from a book. That one's called the Intellectual's Chair. Although Da Luca mainly makes his sculptures from wood, he also does some pieces in marble. From this material, he makes beautiful items that are used to decorate gardens all over the world. He has also done some work in bronze, but says he is less interested in exploring that as a medium now. I couldn't leave Da Luca's showroom without ordering a piece for my parents. I know they will find his work very beautiful, and quite humorous too. What strikes me most about it is its natural appearance. You just can't believe that such things have been made out of such a hard substance as wood. The galleries I saw in Florence were, of course, amazing, but Da Luca's showroom was undoubtedly one of the highlights of my trip to Italy. Now you will hear the talk again. I'm here today to tell you a little about an extraordinary Italian sculptor called Aldo da Luca. I discovered him quite by chance. I'd gone to Italy to spend some time in Florence, visiting the fascinating art galleries there. While I was there, I decided to go and see Padua before heading back to my everyday life. And while I was there, I happened to come across Da Luca's showroom right in the centre of the city. I'd just been to a museum and was very excited by some of the wonderful modern paintings I'd seen there. <laughs> Suddenly, I noticed a clothesline hanging across the window of a sculptor's showroom. That's odd, I thought. Why on earth would a sculptor have his T-shirts and socks hanging up to dry in his showroom window? I was curious, and I decided to enter the showroom. Once inside, I saw Aldo de Luca himself working on a carving. He was making a jacket. It was simply beautiful and very realistic. It was only then that I realised that Everything in the window of the showroom was actually made of wood. And a coat on a hook on the wall was made of wood too, as was a hat above it. I had to touch it because it was so hard to believe that all the items I saw around me were actually not real. 
I got talking to Aldo da Luca, and he told me that the wood he was using to carve the jacket was walnut. He told me he often uses cherry, which he said was his favorite, and many of his most successful works are made of a type of Italian pine. Da Luca takes much of his inspiration from the ordinary objects we wear or use every day. However, he's also interested in designing pieces that represent abstract ideas. He showed me one of his pieces which he'd called Happiness. I was really struck by the beauty of this piece. He said he likes working on both types of work equally, as they provide different challenges for him as an artist. I asked him which of the many works of art he's created is his favourite. First, he showed me a work called Raincoat. I really loved it. But then he changed his mind and chose a different work called Umbrella. He could only show me a photo of that, but it was certainly an impressive piece. My own personal favourite was a wonderful chair with a seat made from a book. That one's called the Intellectual's Chair. Although Da Luca mainly makes his sculptures from wood, he also does some pieces in marble. From this material, he makes beautiful items that are used to decorate gardens all over the world. He has also done some work in bronze, but says he is less interested in exploring that as a medium now. I couldn't leave Da Luca's showroom without ordering a piece for my parents. I know they will find his work very beautiful and quite humorous too. What strikes me most about it is its natural appearance. You just can't believe that such things have been made out of such a hard substance as wood. The galleries I saw in Florence were, of course, amazing, but Da Luca's showroom was undoubtedly one of the highlights of my trip to Italy. That is the end of question 5. In a moment, you will hear question 6. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 6. You will hear six people talking about an experience they will always remember. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. Speaker 1. One of the most memorable days I've ever had was going to a performance by my favourite comedian, Bill Bateman. I went with my sister and we had a fantastic time, even better than I'd expected. But it wasn't just the show and the music. We got chatting to some girls near us and one of them is now one of my closest friends. She was visiting from Paris and last summer I went to stay with her. I've always dreamed of going to Paris and you could say that actually getting there was all thanks to Bill Bateman. Speaker 2 For my birthday, I went to a football match. It was a big international game, and I had a brilliant seat near the front. 
I was really lucky because my uncle had been involved in renovating the stadium. He's not keen on football himself, but he was able to get tickets for me and a friend. I'd like to think I'd improved my football skills by watching such world-class players, though I'm not sure my sports teacher would agree. Speaker 3 Last summer I had a brilliant weekend on a beautiful island in a lake. We were camping and there were no houses for miles around. We were totally on our own, one little tent under the stars. Just my best friend, her sister, her mum and me. The thing was, I'd been rather dreading it. I'd never slept in a tent before and I thought it might be really uncomfortable and cold. But it was such fun cooking and singing around a bonfire. And my sleeping bag was really cosy. Speaker 4 I was in a queue to buy tickets for a movie the other day. A friend of mine actually had a very small part singing a song in the film. So I was looking forward to seeing her and not paying much attention to anything going on around. But then I became aware of a couple chatting behind me. Their voices sounded familiar. I glanced round, and it was Sunita Shah and Mahesh Khan, two of my favourite movie stars. My family doesn't believe me. If only I'd had someone else with me. And I wish I'd asked them for their autographs. Speaker 5 We went on a school trip last year. We went to a fashion museum, a place with loads of clothes from all sorts of centuries and countries, as well as other stuff associated with fashion. Letters written by famous dress designers, that sort of thing. My grandma had actually worked in the museum when she was younger, and I'd been longing to visit it for as long as I can remember. It was great! I learnt so much, and it's inspired me to start learning how to sew. Speaker 6 I'll never forget the first time I went canoeing with a friend and his dad when I was quite young. I'd never been before, and I wasn't sure what to expect but I found I was actually pretty good at it, and I often go on my own now. So I guess that day was important, because it's had quite an impact on my life. I wouldn't enter canoeing competitions or anything like that, and I often don't go very far, but that doesn't really matter. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 One of the most memorable days I've ever had was going to a performance by my favourite comedian, Bill Bateman. I went with my sister and we had a fantastic time, even better than I'd expected. But it wasn't just the show and the music. We got chatting to some girls near us and one of them is now one of my closest friends. She was visiting from Paris, and last summer I went to stay with her. I've always dreamed of going to Paris, and you could say that actually getting there was all thanks to Bill Bateman. Speaker 2 For my birthday, I went to a football match. It was a big international game, and I had a brilliant seat near the front. I was really lucky because my uncle had been involved in renovating the stadium. He's not keen on football himself, but he was able to get tickets for me and a friend. 
I'd like to think I'd improved my football skills by watching such world-class players. Though, I'm not sure my sports teacher would agree. Speaker 3 Last summer I had a brilliant weekend on a beautiful island in a lake. We were camping and there were no houses for miles around. We were totally on our own, one little tent under the stars. Just my best friend, her sister, her mum and me. The thing was, I'd been rather dreading it. I'd never slept in a tent before and I thought it might be really uncomfortable and cold. But it was such fun cooking and singing around a bonfire and my sleeping bag was really cosy. Speaker 4 I was in a queue to buy tickets for a movie the other day. A friend of mine actually had a very small part singing a song in the film, so I was looking forward to seeing her and not paying much attention to anything going on around. But then I became aware of a couple chatting behind me. Their voices sounded familiar. I glanced round and it was Sunita Shah and Mahesh Khan, two of my favourite movie stars. My family doesn't believe me. If only I'd had someone else with me. And I wish I'd asked them for their autographs. Speaker 5 We went on a school trip last year. We went to a fashion museum, a place with loads of clothes from all sorts of centuries and countries as well as other stuff associated with fashion. Letters written by famous dress designers, that sort of thing. My grandma had actually worked in the museum when she was younger, and I'd been longing to visit it for as long as I can remember. It was great. I learnt so much, and it's inspired me to start learning how to sew. Speaker 6 I'll never forget the first time I went canoeing with a friend and his dad when I was quite young. I'd never been before and I wasn't sure what to expect. But I found I was actually pretty good at it and I often go on my own now. So I guess that day was important because it's had quite an impact on my life. I wouldn't enter canoeing competitions or anything like that and I often don't go very far but that doesn't really matter. That is the end of question 6. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. You will hear Emily, a student, asking Mark Robinson about his life as an aquatic ecologist as part of a college radio program. Listen to their conversation and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the conversation twice. Mark, can I ask what you enjoy most about your job as an aquatic ecologist? Well, my job is to travel around the world doing what I can to help fish whose existence is endangered. 
It's wonderful to feel that I'm doing all I can to stop some amazing creatures from becoming extinct. But probably the most rewarding thing is that I'm also making sure that fishermen, whose livelihood depends on those creatures, do not lose their traditional way of life. Were you interested in wildlife as a child? Sure. Although my brothers and I grew up in a city, we had a big garden with lots of trees. We each had our favourite place in the biggest tree, and we worked out ways to climb from tree to tree without ever touching the ground. My clearest childhood memories all have to do with the outdoors and animals, particularly insects when I was very small. One of the first things I can remember doing is watching bees going into some flowers. As I got older, I became fascinated with animal shows on TV, and I'd wake up early to watch them. How did you become an aquatic ecologist? Well, my parents had hoped I'd study medicine. My teacher suggested I might like to work in a zoo, because I was interested in animals. I've always done what I love, which led to where I am now. Whenever I've had choices, I've chosen the path that made me excited. I'm hesitant to recommend that approach, though, because there is hard work involved, and not everything that I've ever done has been enjoyable. Mm. What do you most enjoy doing on days when you're not away working? Well, I have to prepare for projects as well as do reports on trips that have already taken place. And, of course, I also do some teaching at the university. That's probably the best bit of my work when I'm at home. Though I enjoy all of what I do. In other words, when I'm not travelling, I spend my time reading and responding to emails, making plans, buying equipment, meeting with students, attending seminars and preparing articles about my research. Your latest field trip was to Mongolia, wasn't it? How was that? It was extremely interesting. In Mongolia, we were working with fishermen to gather information about the ecology of the world's largest trout. It was especially interesting there because we lived in Mongolian yurts. That's what their traditional tents are called. We ate traditional food and relied on solar energy to power our equipment. It made it hard for us that temperatures there can drop to zero degrees, and it was sometimes a challenge just to keep our equipment and ourselves in good condition. I read an article you wrote in a geographical magazine. Do you do much journalism? I do. The magazine has provided a lot of money over the years, as it has funded much of my work, so I have to spend some of my time working with the editorial team to produce news stories or shows for television. I enjoy that because it gives me a chance to communicate with a large number of people who might not otherwise have the opportunity to find out about threatened fish and their habitats. What do you do to relax? Sometimes I do what everyone else does, hang out with friends, watch movies, or work in my garden. But I also spend a lot of my free time with activities related to my work, helping other scientists with their work, visiting aquariums, fishing, or watching other people fish. Or you'll find me on the riverbank just watching the world go by. That's what I find most relaxing. What's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? A university tutor once told me, you aren't pushing yourself hard enough or taking enough risks unless you fail 50% of the time. While I don't agree with him 100%, I like the saying because it means it's okay to take risks, it's okay to fail. I think that those have been important lessons for me. Although I'm still disappointed when I fail, it's enabled me to cope. It's been very interesting. Thank you for talking to us today, Mark. Now you will hear the conversation again. Mark, can I ask what you enjoy most about your job as an aquatic ecologist? Well, my job is to travel around the world doing what I can to help fish whose existence is endangered. It's wonderful to feel that I'm doing all I can to stop some amazing creatures from becoming extinct. But probably the most rewarding thing is that I'm also making sure that fishermen whose livelihood depends on those creatures, do not lose their traditional way of life. 
Were you interested in wildlife as a child? Sure. Although my brothers and I grew up in a city, we had a big garden with lots of trees. We each had our favourite place in the biggest tree, and we worked out ways to climb from tree to tree without ever touching the ground. My clearest childhood memories all have to do with the outdoors and animals, particularly insects when I was very small. One of the first things I can remember doing is watching bees going into some flowers. As I got older, I became fascinated with animal shows on TV, and I'd wake up early to watch them. How did you become an aquatic ecologist? Well, my parents had hoped I'd study medicine. My teacher suggested I might like to work in a zoo because I was interested in animals. I've always done what I love, which led to where I am now. Whenever I've had choices, I've chosen the path that made me excited. I'm hesitant to recommend that approach, though, because there is hard work involved, and not everything that I've ever done has been enjoyable. Mm. What do you most enjoy doing on days when you're not away working? Well, I have to prepare for projects as well as do reports on trips that have already taken place. And, of course, I also do some teaching at the university. That's probably the best bit of my work when I'm at home. Though I enjoy all of what I do. In other words, when I'm not travelling, I spend my time reading and responding to emails, making plans, buying equipment, meeting with students, attending seminars and preparing articles about my research. Your latest field trip was to Mongolia, wasn't it? How was that? It was extremely interesting. In Mongolia, we were working with fishermen to gather information about the ecology of the world's largest trout. It was especially interesting there because we lived in Mongolian yurts. That's what their traditional tents are called. We ate traditional food and relied on solar energy to power our equipment. It made it hard for us that temperatures there can drop to zero degrees, and it was sometimes a challenge just to keep our equipment and ourselves in good condition. I read an article you wrote in a geographical magazine. Do you do much journalism? I do. The magazine has provided a lot of money over the years, as it has funded much of my work, so I have to spend some of my time working with the editorial team to produce news stories or shows for television. I enjoy that because it gives me a chance to communicate with a large number of people who might not otherwise have the opportunity to find out about threatened fish and their habitats. What do you do to relax? Sometimes I do what everyone else does, hang out with friends, watch movies, or work in my garden. But I also spend a lot of my free time with activities related to my work, helping other scientists with their work, visiting aquariums, fishing, or watching other people fish. Or you'll find me on the riverbank just watching the world go by. That's what I find most relaxing. What's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? A university tutor once told me, you aren't pushing yourself hard enough or taking enough risks unless you fail 50% of the time. While I don't agree with him 100%, I like the saying because it means it's okay to take risks, it's okay to fail. I think that those have been important lessons for me. Although I'm still disappointed when I fail, it's enabled me to cope. It's been very interesting. Thank you for talking to us today, Mark. That is the end of question 7. In a moment you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8, Part A. You will hear a business lecturer 
giving a talk about a successful young businesswoman called Afwa Mensa. Listen to the talk and complete the details in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. You don't have to be middle-aged to be a business success. The main thing is to have a good idea, and those sometimes seem to come more easily to young people. Let me tell you about one case study. Afwa Mensa was only 11 years old when she went bald after using a hair conditioning product. This had a huge impact on her confidence, and longing to get her hair to grow back, Afwa tried everything on the market. In the process, she started noticing all the chemicals contained in virtually every product she came across. Determined never to put another chemical on her hair again, she started her search for all natural products she could use instead, only to find that there weren't any out there. So ten years ago, she set out researching and mixing ingredients until she came up with a product she was satisfied with. At first, she wanted to use the bathroom for her work, but her mother objected, so she based herself in the kitchen. Eventually, as the project became more complicated, she took over the family's garage and then expanded further into the basement of her home. From that early age, Afwa's big idea was really a vision. To create a line of hair products completely free from harmful chemicals so that no girl or woman would ever have to go through what she went through. When she was 13, Afwa attended a summer business camp where she learned how to set up and run a business. At the camp, she and the other young participants were given legal advice, along with practical information about packaging and distribution. When she came home, she persuaded her parents to give her some financial support, and she was soon officially in business. She started with a trolley full of products that she would take from one beauty salon to another, asking staff and customers if they wanted to try them. Her products quickly caught on, and information about them spread not by advertising, but by word of mouth. The first hair oil she developed has turned out to be particularly popular, and this remains her best seller, though shampoos and a range of colorants have also had a great deal of success. It was just a matter of time before she was running a full-scale business in her family's basement. Afwa's sister was her first employee, and eventually her mother left a $100,000 a year job to work for her daughter. The company has grown from Afwa producing one bottle in her kitchen to a large manufacturing plant with 78 employees and producing 64 5-litre drums each month. So now I'd like you to see what else you can find out about Afwa Mensa's business. Now you will hear the talk again. You don't have to be middle-aged to be a business success. The main thing is to have a good idea, and those sometimes seem to come more easily to young people. Let me tell you about one case study. Afwa Mensa was only 11 years old when she went bald after using a hair conditioning product. This had a huge impact on her confidence, and longing to get her hair to grow back, Afwa tried everything on the market. In the process, she started noticing all the chemicals contained in virtually every product she came across. Determined never to put another chemical on her hair again, she started her search for all natural products she could use instead, only to find that there weren't any out there. 
So ten years ago, she set out researching and mixing ingredients until she came up with a product she was satisfied with. At first, she wanted to use the bathroom for her work, but her mother objected, so she based herself in the kitchen. Eventually, as the project became more complicated, she took over the family's garage, and then expanded further into the basement of her home. From that early age, Afwa's big idea was really a vision to create a line of hair products completely free from harmful chemicals, so that no girl or woman would ever have to go through what she went through. When she was thirteen. Afwa attended a summer business camp, where she learned how to set up and run a business. At the camp, she and the other young participants were given legal advice, along with practical information about packaging and distribution. When she came home, she persuaded her parents to give her some financial support, and she was soon officially in business. She started with a trolley full of products that she would take from one beauty salon to another, asking staff and customers if they wanted to try them. Her products quickly caught on, and information about them spread not by advertising, but by word of mouth. The first hair oil she developed has turned out to be particularly popular, and this remains her best seller. Though shampoos and a range of colorants have also had a great deal of success. It was just a matter of time before she was running a full-scale business in her family's basement. Afwa's sister was her first employee, and eventually her mother left a hundred thousand dollar a year job to work for her daughter. The company has grown from Afwa producing one bottle in her kitchen to a large manufacturing plant with seventy-eight employees and producing sixty-four. Five-liter drums each month. So now I'd like you to see what else you can find out about Afwa Mensa's business. Question 8, Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students and complete the details in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. That was a really interesting case study about Afwa Mensa, wasn't it? Mm. Amazing to hear of someone making such a success of a business before they've even left school. Absolutely. So, did you manage to find out any more about her? Yeah, there was quite a lot about her online. Although it sounds like a dream come true story, it hasn't been an easy road. You mean when she entered that business competition? The prize was in the form of a sponsor who would oversee her business plan and help her raise money, but she didn't even make the shortlist of twenty. Exactly. She said it was really annoying that she was often not taken seriously due to her age. When she was first promoting her products, she was often laughed at, and people stared at her like she was a joke or something. She found this really disheartening. Yes, but then she became even more determined to show them that being young was not going to hold her back. She persevered and then managed to enter into negotiations with a big chain of beauty salons. Yes, I read about that too. It's a pity it fell through. True. But at least she pulled off a deal with an international supermarket company. That really made her business turn the corner. Yes, that combined with her TV appearance. Oh, I didn't find anything about that. I know she featured in several business magazines. That's right, and an article in one of those led to her being interviewed on a chat show. That resulted in hundreds of orders from some quite major companies, and I gather she's appearing in a documentary soon. Great. So, did you find out anything about what she likes to do when she isn't working? I gather she's quite an enthusiastic tennis player. Yes, and she plays basketball too. 
but she also helps out with some voluntary work. She visits old people with no families in the town where she lives. Really? Yeah. Good for her. And did you discover how she's left her business in the hands of her sister for a few years while she goes off to study at university? No, I didn't. You've found out lots more than I have. She's doing a business degree, I presume, or engineering? Actually, she's opted for biochemistry. Maybe she's planning to diversify her business into some rather different areas. She said it's important that young people don't restrict their horizons. Now you will hear the conversation again. That was a really interesting case study about Afwa Mensa, wasn't it? Mm. Amazing to hear of someone making such a success of a business before they've even left school. Absolutely. So did you manage to find out any more about her? Yeah, there was quite a lot about her online. Although it sounds like a dream come true story, it hasn't been an easy road. You mean when she entered that business competition? The prize was in the form of a sponsor who would oversee her business plan and help her raise money, but she didn't even make the shortlist of 20. Exactly. She said it was really annoying that she was often not taken seriously due to her age. When she was first promoting her products, she was often laughed at, and people stared at her like she was a joke or something. She found this really disheartening. Yes, but then she became even more determined to show them that being young was not going to hold her back. She persevered and then managed to enter into negotiations with a big chain of beauty salons. Yes, I read about that too. It's a pity it fell through. True, but at least she pulled off a deal with an international supermarket company. That really made her business turn the corner. Yes, that combined with her TV appearance. Oh, I didn't find anything about that. I know she featured in several business magazines. That's right. And an article in one of those led to her being interviewed on a chat show. That resulted in hundreds of orders from some quite major companies. And I gather she's appearing in a documentary soon. Great. So did you find out anything about what she likes to do when she isn't working? I gather she's quite an enthusiastic tennis player. Yes. And she plays basketball too. But she also helps out with some voluntary work. She visits old people with no families in the town where she lives. Really? Yeah. Good for her. And did you discover how she's left her business in the hands of her sister for a few years while she goes off to study at university? No, I didn't. You've found out lots more than I have. She's doing a business degree, I presume, or engineering? Actually, she's opted for biochemistry. Maybe she's planning to diversify her business into some rather different areas. She said it's important that young people don't restrict their horizons. That is the end of question 8 and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper.